And we're joined today on It's Art, Let's Talk About It by our good friend, Carol Arnold. And Carol, thanks for joining me in the studio to talk about art today. I appreciate you asking me, Yeah, Darryl. it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's really funny. I, I say this to all the artists just about, because it's really become such a, a, a trend, is that I talk to artists all the time about art, dinner, lunches, just, and they love talking about art, but for some reason you get them in a microphone, put a head, set of headsets on them, and they begin to freak out. It's... Uh, guilty. <laughs> it's only a couple of thousand people are going to be listening to this. It just changes things, it changes does, the game. But technology. And the bottom line is this podcast is called It's Art. Let's talk about it. And so let's talk about art. Let's talk about your art. Okay. Let's talk about the art world in general, the Museum of Western Art. And we're, we're happy to have you on the podcast. So let's start by, first of all, talking about your art, what kind of art you do, how you would classify your art. It's it. It's mostly landscapes, florals, that kind of thing. And uh, you do pastels, right? I do. I am I consider myself a pastelist. I dabbled in oils for a little bit, but I had random people say, your pastels are just the bit. And so I thought, okay, why am I going to spend time doing oils? <laughs> so I, moved, I just went to pastels, and I liked them because I, when I paint, I'm, it's an emotional thing for me, so I like to begin, I like to finish. I can't sit and let a part of it dry and then come back to it later. I really like to get the majority done within the days that I begin a painting. So pastels just really agreed with the way I work, the way my brain works, my mind. And for me, pastels and my artwork's a lot of emotion. I, I just gravitate toward pastel. What's your favorite subject? I really like clouds, honestly. I like clouds. I like landscape. West Texas, I have family roots with West Texas, and it's dear to my heart and speaks to me. I also, I like wildlife, but I do dog portraits for people. I do flowers. I like I basically God's nature. I, I really can pick any subject and to do a little bit of everything because it keeps it interesting to change you it. You paint big, small? With pastels, I'd say my favorite size would be anywhere from 11 by 14 to 24 by 36. Larger, smaller. Smaller is fine, but funny enough, it's harder to paint smaller than it is larger. And uh, I hear that a lot for pastel artists, that they, yeah. can, they can go big. And I, I think that's mostly due to the nature of the material. But you're, it could it you know, could be. And the to, chalks that you're using, things that you're using are just, they're, they're a bigger medium. And to go larger, I just did a couple of 24 by 36 paintings for the Peterson Hospital new building. And I've done 37 by 48. But when you get that big with pastel, it's just harder to transport and harder to deal with. How'd you with. get started in art? All my life, I have drawn. And it's just that was an outlet for me. If I sat by myself or I was feeling sad or happy or whatever, I would just pick a pencil up and I would doodle, I'd draw. And as I got older, I wanted to learn a little more. At college, I took some watercolor classes. I actually was a petroleum land management major in college on the business end. And I took art, but there was no one in my family really encouraging the art side of life. So I went with the PLM degree. But when I came to the Hill Country and I just, long story short, I analyzed my life and I thought, what am I not doing that God really had on my heart to do? And it was to create and actually become an artist. What, and one of the reasons I ask, and I, I tell this a lot in our podcast, is it runs a gamut. My friend Jack Sorensen said he used to draw on his mother's walls and it was, he's been doing it since he was three. It's all he ever wanted to do was an artist. It's all he's ever done. Mm -hmm. And yet people like Rachel Brownlee, who's been on the podcast, she just started in her late twenties, only been drawing three years at this point, painting three years. And it was never. My, you know, my first, my first victory in art was in second grade. I, I was, <laughs> I was at a friend's slumber party and the mother had a little art contest and I drew a little girl with a flowers in her hand standing in front of her little square house. And I wanted a little, one of those little turtles. I used to, we used to have turtles as pets. Yeah. And I, I want a turtle. And I thought, this was really pretty cool. And so that's all the encouragement I needed was to win, win a turtle. turtle at a slumber party. Ah. And I thought, okay, I could do this. But you had another career. 
Yeah. You're talking about petroleum. Yeah. Yes. I I was a oil and gas landman for a few years. I also had real estate brokers. Before I had children, I worked full time. And after the second child, I couldn't work and take care of kids at the same time. So I, I quit that and took care of my children. And at that time, I couldn't paint. I couldn't draw. I couldn't do anything because I was just focused on their life. And as every mother listening knows, it's you're running the whole time. And as they got older and we moved to Kerrville and they were in high school, junior high got a little older, I'd find at nine o'clock at night when they would go to sleep, I would use that time to paint. And so I would just get the pastels out and know thing about pastel, I could pick it up, put it down. I didn't have to worry about drying or drying out or what was I doing before because it was there waiting for me. And I could carry on my life with my family, come back to it, and see what I created. No and brushes to clean, no turpentine to mess with. No, no smells, no none smells, of that. Yeah. yeah, it was really, people say, how about all that dust? And yeah, you do get a lot of dust, but you can clean dust up pretty easily whenever you're ready to get it clean. And that was really the beginning. And I didn't, the other factor for every artist, and I'm saying every artist, even the best artist you've ever talked to, is there's that doubt. Am I good enough or am I a fraud? Is this, is my art? as good as someone else, or is it still matching up? Yes. I had to conquer those fears and those doubts and that insecurity of showing anybody. And so years ago, I, I showed someone, and they bought, they wanted to buy something. I thought, that was cool. And then another, someone else, and then someone that had a store in Slato picked up some work for that, and that, that just began that I thought, okay, I can show people this. And as, as it grew over the years, I realized I'm not painting for anyone else. I'm painting for me. So I let go of worrying about if this is going to sell and thought more about how do I feel about creating and getting better at my craft. How long was it between the time you picked up the pastels at nine o'clock at night after the kids went to bed before you considered yourself a, a qualified artist? It, it was still some time because I, I do local shows and I would, would uh, say, um, but I felt like I had a lot to learn. I took many years of classes with different artists from all over the country in, in oil as well as pastel to learn. And I'm, I'm still learning. I, I'm yeah. still growing. But I just think in the last 10, 10 years, 15 years, I feel, I, I feel as confident as I, I need to feel. Do you remember those first early classes? Who were they taught by? Stephen Knapper, okay. who was a local pastelist, sure. and Kathleen Cook, another local. That two wonderful people has passed away, and Kathleen is still here and is an amazing portrait artist, among other things, and took from Albert Handel, who's like the father of pastels, and Kim Laurier, and just many people, many, many people, and uh Impressionists, tonalists I've taken from Dennis Sheehan and Charlie Hunter and who are too oiled. You think that's important? That young artist out there saying, can I take away from listening to Carol Arnold talk about her art was that you took a lot of classes? I do. I, I think that's utmost of importance. And I also think when you take these classes, it's not to go in there and try. I see, I teach classes now and I think everyone has their own style, and you go into these classes and you have those, especially Albert Handel, that people treasure everything he says and does, and you have people that go in there and they're just copying everything he's doing. And to me, you go in these classes to pick up another tool for your tool belt of how you paint to add to your toolkit on a new part of your craft that you can haven't tried before. Um, there are different, some artists will do an underpainting with alcohol wash in pastel, and some might use mineral spirits, and some blur, and some uh, use acrylics. And there's just so many types of ways to paint. And in oil, you can paint wet on wet or, or glaze. There's so many types, and each artist has their own tools that they use. And so every class I've ever taken from an oil painter or a pastelist to whatever, I've learned something new to add to the way I paint. I'm not trying to copy. I'm trying to develop what speaks to me and what I want to share with what I'm seeing in my vision. We're joined today by our good friend, Carol Arnold, on It's Art. Let's talk about it. And Carol, let's talk about your your studio. 
Let's talk about your upstairs studio there at mm -hmm. your house. You're incredible. Yes. I've been there. Great views of the Texas Hill Country. And you've always got something on the easel. Yes. I I don't know if people that are not in the art world realize that how art is a real discipline. So, yeah, yeah. let's talk about your day, though. I yeah. mean, and it varies. I've talked to artists who, boy, they get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, hit it till noon, take a break, and then hit it till 5, and then they're done. And other artists who wait around until the muse strikes, and sometimes it's 2 in the morning, and it lasts 3 days, and then it's done. What's your typical? Yeah, er everybody's different. Yeah, everybody's I, different. I cannot, as a rule, walk upstairs to my studio unless I've done all my, quote, chores for the family for the or the house. day. Because once I walk up there, time is not important. And I will start something, and then I'll realize I've been up there five or six hours. And so I can't do that until I am I have nothing else that I have to get done for that day. And I try to, um, depending on if, if I have a... Um, actual painting that I'm you know, trying to get out, then I might go in there early in the morning and just block in several days. How many paintings do you have going at once? I ha always have, I have one painting going at once, but I have several paintings around me that I might look at and go back to. And when I'm doing this one painting, I might look over and I see this that I'm doing here, this technique, these colors together would do, I feel that on that painting on the wall. And I will bring that over and I will fool with it a little bit. But as I, I said, I'm a one painter, one, I have to start and I have to finish. I don't like having two or three things, big things going at once. So that's It's interesting because I way. talk to artists all the time and Jason Skull comes to mind. His studio, he's got 25 works. He's got maquettes going, oversized works, works he needs to finish. And I walk into a studio, what you working on today? Because mm -hmm. it's, I'm back to this, I'm back to this horse. Because he can't stay focused on that one thing all the way through to completion. And yet it sounds like that's what you pretty much have to do. It, it's That's just how my brain works. I, it's locks on something and it just stays on it until I get it to a point. Now, that's not to say that I don't have paintings that are sitting around that I have not totally completed. Because I, I have one or two paintings. I think these are really great paintings. But I'm not going to frame them yet because I, there's something missing I haven't put in. And so I will set them aside and I'll wait till something strikes me and I realize what it needed, I did not add. But it's different than, say, an oil painting where you, you have to, I'm doing this layer and I'm coming back and doing the second or third layer. I try to get the main gist of the painting done before I begin another one. A lot of people, and we talk about this often on this show, a lot of people when they're listening to the podcast want to play along, if you will. They want to go out to the website and look at the works of the artist. How do they do that? My main way of broadcasting my work is on Instagram. Instagram, okay. I like Instagram. And it's C. Arnold Fine Art, all, all together, hashtag C. Arnold Fine Art. There's a different artist, Carol Arnold, that lives in Boston. And she got all the Carol Arnold websites before I got them. So I have to be C. Arnold. And my website is www.carnoldfineart.com. C. Arnold. Fine yes. Art. Oh. yes, and that's how I sign my paintings too, C. Arnold, as opposed to Carol writing Carol. And then we'll post a bunch of photos of your work, work we've had in the past at our shows, and then works that we've gotten from you on mm -hmm. our website as people are finding our, our website, podcast website. They can click on it. And while they listen to this, look at your works. Look oh, at yeah, that's the, great. Explains it. I think that's always fun to play along with it. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I've noticed about your work in the five years that, that we've been friends and I've known you as a professional artist is that you do tend to do a lot of West Texas. You do a lot of Big Ben. I do. We, Favorite place and why? I love the open Tough environment, though. It, it, it is, but I love it. I, I love the tough environment. I love the tough toughness of the people and the character and the soul of, of West Texas at Big Ben. We go out there standing reservations twice a year to hike and uh, occasionally camp or whatever in uh, Big Ben. And uh, we love going to Marathon. I have work at the Gage Gallery in Marathon, Texas at the Gage Hotel. And I take a lot of photographs. People think the painting doesn't start when I pull the paper out. The painting started when I'm out somewhere seeing the landscape, seeing the quail, and then I have to photograph to bring things back to the studio if I'm not going to be painting on site. And so I just love going out there because every trip we've taken, there's always something new I find or see 
And it just connects. Everybody has some place that they connect with. And for me, and luckily my roadie, my husband, Bill, <laughs> he drives me around and, and sits out in the cold morning dawn in his chair in the middle of some road in the middle of nowhere while I'm taking pictures. That He loves it too. So we do a, we're a good team out in West Texas. Do you play an airplane? I do, and I actually, it's a little addicting. I, I like plain air. I'm, I'm a fair weather plain air person. When when it's cold, I don't like it. And they're, I, my hat goes off to plain air artists because they're a whole different breed and they're they're pretty amazing. But you learn so much from plain air and, and talking to any artists out there. I used to hear this and I thought I can take good pictures, but you just cannot capture what you can capture when you paint from a live scene. And I try. I always paint small when I do that, and I I keep a lot of those pieces for reference. And but I learn from those as well because the colors are different. The photographs make things darker and skew things. And from live plein air painting, you can just capture and get a feel for, that you can bring back to the studio with you. One of the things we we mentioned earlier is your your love of taking classes, but you've also taught. You've done a couple of workshops here at the Museum of Western Art. This is my favorite place to teach classes, and I want to do one this spring or this fall sometime, but you have this beautiful world-class museum with amazing artwork from amazing artists and the best volunteers I've ever seen anywhere run by the best director. And Folks that did not pay her to say <laughs> that. But it's a it's a real treat. The, the artists or the people that come to take the class, we all... Uh, love it, and they love it. And we can go around and look at the artwork on the walls, and I have them do sketches to understand what I'm trying to teach about values and color and composition. And it's just, just a, you, you can't get that. You know, we did seven last year, seven workshops, and they were all sold out. Mm -hmm. We have five already on the books, working on three or four more. And people are encouraged to take our Tuesday newsletter. A newsletter comes out every Tuesday morning that talks about the workshops, it talks about the things we're doing, and then watch our website under the workshops tab. You can see what workshops we have and how to get involved in that, and hopefully we'll get you on board for, for another workshop. But I like that. you think workshops are important to uh, new artists? At what level should you start taking workshops? Day one, this is a piece of charcoal, this is a brush, this is a canvas, or, you know, people need to play around for a while before they... It depends on what class you're taking. I know they have classes for true beginners, and um, I try to go from beginner up to late intermediate. At advanced, they probably don't need my class. They're with me, but the, the I think you learn any time you take a class. I think the hardest thing about a class is getting over feeling like everybody in the class is better than you and, and judging what everybody's doing, because if you walk around looking at everybody's artwork, it's Maybe the same scene we're working on, but it looks all totally different. And it's all about you personally gaining something from a class. And uh, you, like I said, you're going to gain something from it no matter what. If you're interested, I'm actually a good person for pastels for any beginners because I make it very simple. I make it fun. And again, my whole thing is just conquering that fear of being afraid to start. For that hobbyist out there who's thinking, oh, I want to start painting and Carol's got me inspired to do pastels. What do they need to buy? What's the what's your basic pastel kit? And can you get one? Just one oh one. You I like new pastels in you. It's it's N U P A S T E E L. It's a hard pastel and it comes in a set of ninety six. So it's every color you could think of to be for a beginner to have. And I would buy one of those sets. You remember to, those crayon boxes as kids? Yes. We were our 64. Family. That was yeah, a big one. <laughs> that was the big one with the eraser on the back. No. And you had silver. That was, if you had a silver crayon, that was like the best. <laughs> but yeah, new pastel and then pastel paper is different from other papers. It's got a grit to it to hold the pastel in the paper so you can layer. And there's a UART. And that's, it's U-A-R-T paper for pastelists. And they have different. Grit's much like sandpaper, and I use Grit 400, which is a smoother but has a good enough grit where I can layer five, eight, ten colors and not lose the grit in the paper. So that the you at you art 400 and new pastel pastels would be my two things that I would pick That's up. That's interesting because you don't think about chalk 
as having something that's layerable. Well, and I have to tell you also that pastels, there's a difference in chalk. Yeah. And I'm just going to throw that out there for you to hit that ball. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah, so I always, every pastel is... Well, I'll say that in a class one time. Yes, it's and not so, chalk. Yeah. No, chalk is is basically calcium carbonate, limestone, with color added to it, and that makes chalk. So if you ever see chalk, I know artists that do sidewalk chalk. It's not sidewalk pastel, it's sidewalk chalk. You, they can go further with that calcium carbonate in there because they don't have as many minerals in the uh, actual stick itself. Now, pastel is actually the same minerals that are in oil paint, except for it doesn't have oil added. It has a dry binder that holds those minerals together to make a stick of pastel. So when you look at pastel, the colors are true pigment, and that's why people love them so much, because you can get such vibrant, clear, pure colors. And so it's a dry pigment, dry binder, same minerals that are in the oil paints without the oil. Who are the great pastelists? To today, I mean to these days, currently, right? Yeah. Uh, Albert Handel is number one great greatest pastelist in my personal opinion. And I love Kim Laurier is a is it's what do you connect with? Who who right. do you collect connect and with? the reason I ask is that we have a lot of people who'll say they listen to this podcast and an artist will throw out a, a, a product like you just mentioned, the new pastel line, and they write that stuff down. They're taking a class when they're listening to us because they're talking to an artist and they wouldn't have gotten a chance to visit with that artist. Mm -hmm. They haven't been introduced to Carol Arnold, for example, and don't know how to pick her brain at lunch and how to do that. There's a few of them out there right now who are writing down the, what you're saying. And there, there's a neat guy, Ralph Porter Arts. I like his, and I find these on Instagram. I want you Instagram, they've, you don't control it. You think you control what you're seeing, but they have it all. Uh, they have it all fixed. Where you click on one thing, and all of a sudden you're going to see a lot of that kind of thing. And Porter Arts—that's I think his Instagram name. And he's not from around here, but he does great shadowing in his artwork. And uh, there's Atlanta Ballet up north somewhere that does a lot of ocean scenes. So it just depends on what it is you're interested Subject in. Subject matter really doesn't matter, though, does it? Frank Frank Gray for old pastelists. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's I love his work. And right. I, I guess I'm drawn because those are pretty much the same kind of scenes that I like. And his work's very simple. And he's from yesteryear. And, and so that would be one. And older, if you can get a book on Frank Ray, that would be a good thing to look at. But Degas was, they had pastels, Rembrandt. A lot of the old masters used pastels, but they, their oils were the, the ones that were famous more so than the pastels that they used for sketching. Will you always be a pastelist? I'm dabbling and trying to get back into the, doing some oils on a small, very small scale, but I think pastel is my gift, and so I think, yeah, I always will be a pastelist. Is it subject matter driven? People think about pastels, they think about flower vases and still lifes. And, no, I, I can do, do anything. You do some really Western works. I've seen some of your works that are very tough landscapes. I've, I've gotten some very... Wonderful compliments. I didn't say it, and maybe they really didn't know anything about art. They compared me to Julian Onderdonk occasionally. <laughs> or, Not bad company. Or Andrew Wyeth. Sure. I, I recently did a couple of paintings that are more of an Edward Hopper looking contemporary type paintings. You could do anything you want to. It's just whatever strikes you. And I tend to not like to stay in a box. I tend to like to paint what triggers something when I see it. And so let's talk about shows and exhibitions. Uh, of course, you have a standing exhibition offer with the Museum of Western Art oh. Roundup. I love it. Uh, it's exciting. It's such a great show and you do such a great job for us. And we've sold a bunch of your work out here over the years. Mm -hmm. um, the 41st annual Roundup is coming up and you'll be a part of that. I'm ready in April. I'm excited April about that. April 26 and 27. And But what other representation? Can we talk about that marathon? Marathon, the Gage Hotel, I have, they have some of my black and white photography, actually, as well as my paintings. And they recently opened a fine art gallery there at the Gage. And I have, I have artwork in the Gage. All you have to do is ask for me out there. And they all know me. And, they know who and, you are? Yeah, I love it. Bill and I kid, it's our second home. In the fall, I'm in the Museum of the Big Ben show, which is called Trappings of Texas, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful show in Alpine. 
and I hope to do some more museum shows. I, I really well, am enjoying those. And we're joined today by our good friend Carol Arnold, Pastelis from Kerrville, Texas, and you can find her work at carnoldfineart.com. Yeah. And the Instagram page is the C. Arnold Fine Art. C. Arnold Fine Art. And I'm on Facebook, and I think it's just Carol Arnold on Facebook. And you may have to ask to be, be my friend, and I'll let you in. <laughs> <laughs> C. Arnold Facebook. It's Carol Pro. Arnold on Facebook, and the others are C. Arnold Fine Art. What's next for Carol? I've got some. Because uh, even in the five years I've known you, your life has changed a little bit. People have come. You raised a large family. Your husband has a fabulous career, and I know he's he's uh, always involved in that mm -hmm. as an attorney, but your kids are pretty much, you've moved on to grandchildren now. Yeah, I have grandchildren finally. It's a nice, it's nice. I can play with them and then I don't have to be sad when they leave because I just go back upstairs and paint. And so it's it's do do some uh, private classes out of my home. Anybody interested in that, you can always call me about that as well. And I'm, I've got a commission right now for a church in Dallas to do a painting of the outdoor, out St. Michael's Church, Episcopal Church, if anyone knows it, to do the big chapel and the main building for special programs for their, their church. I, I did, someone asked me to do a wedding chapel program for a special wedding, and the church enjoyed it, and they contacted me. So that's fun. That's, like I said, I like challenges. And You consider yourself a prolific painter? Yes, I You do a I'm lot? Pretty, or are you slow? Or what's the deal? No, I'm pretty fast. I, I say that, but that doesn't mean I finish the painting, you know, it might take me four days, but I'm pretty fast to getting it out there. And like I say, I stay focused until I can let go of it. But yes, if you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, I'm putting them out there pretty quickly. I'm doing a program right now. There's an easel called Strata Easel that's doing a, does a, a monthly challenge. You have to post a plein air painting, some sketch, something you've done every day for 31 days, wow. which is a hard thing to do. So I've got to get home and do something for that. But <laughs> So every day I put something on there and the work changes from doing something small that, because I have other things to do to doing an actual painting for that program. But it's good to paint every day for anyone that's interested in the discipline to make yourself do something at least half an hour. Muscle memory. Every day, yes. A lot it, of people it, talk about muscle memory a lot. And it's so much, it's a lot of fun to do that. And Steve Knapper taught me about quick sketches, which I love. Yeah. And that's setting a timer 30 minutes and just that keeps you from doing detail. People, every, most artists are always trying to get a little let, looser in their work and not paint so tight. And doing a quick sketch helps with that. You can only paint the big objects and not get down to the fine lines in that amount of time. So. Our time is up, believe it or not. That's how 30 minutes flies by. There you go. There's a, qu a, there's a quick sketch of yeah, Carol Arnold. a quick sketch on a podcast. <laughs> uh, our podcast comes out every other Thursday. And so watch for the future podcast. But Carol, we appreciate you taking the time today. And thanks for your support, you and Bill, of the Museum of Western Art and for what you're doing in the art world. A lot of fun. We feel very honored to be here, Daryl. We really do. Thank you so much. Appreciate you joining us today on It's Art. Let's talk about it. Our guest has been Carol Arnold. We hope you enjoy its art. Go out to www.museumofwesternart.com for more information or find us wherever your podcast, Apple Podcast, and we're a member of the Texas Podcast, Texas Hill Country Podcast Network. I'll get that right. We appreciate Carol joining us today, and we hope to see you soon on It's Art. Let's talk about it.